I'll try to speak directly to the topic of this conference, which is about acceleration. And I'll also be addressing some of the points that James Meadowcroft made in his presentation yesterday. So one would be the importance of states in accelerating transitions, both historical, historically, but also uh, future ones. And the importance of incumbents, uh, also in their uh, reorientation and the importance for uh, acceleration. This uh, presentation is based on a paper, or more broadly, uh, work I've done with uh, Cameron Roberts. I'm not sure if he's in the room. Cameron, good to see you again here in Canada. Uh, so uh, the, the, the paper on which it's based is, is mentioned in the, in the bottom there, but it's, 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 there's a, a wider research program underlying this. So this is the structure of the talk, just a brief introduction of how I conceptualize uh, acceleration. Uh, then I'll try to uh, really link uh, and reach out to the political scientists and, and draw on uh, historical institutionalism as a political science approach and how that could be combined with the MLP to think about acceleration and major policy change. Two rather brief examples of acceleration and then uh, some conclusions and what this could mean for future uh, relevance, for future uh, sustainability transitions. So the basic finding, and that's something that James already said as well, that policymakers can decisively accelerate socio-technical transitions and have done so, not always, but in many historical transitions. So they can make large investments, they can uh, hand out nice incentives, they can reduce risks, they can tilt the playing field, as James uh, has called it. Well, since we know we need accelerations for future sustainability transitions, but not so many have yet happened, so you can't really study them uh, yet in terms of the full uh, development, we chose to, do, to, to look at at least four historical transitions where there was clear acceleration. Uh, these are the four ones we studied. There are many more that one could study, but we just started with four to, you know, to start to think about what are the main uh, drivers and, and barriers for uh, acceleration. So particularly we're going to look at policymakers, how they can and under which conditions they can accelerate uh, transitions. So the cases are the shift from trains to cars in the United Kingdom, uh, modernization of British agriculture, the shift from uh, coal to gas-based heating in the Netherlands, and then the shift from oil to uh, district heating in Denmark. So I'm not going to talk about all the examples, I'm just flagging this up, there are more cases underlying this. I'll only talk about two of them uh, in this talk. So I said policymakers can accelerate transitions, and I'll give some examples of how they did it. But we also know that this is very difficult from the political science literature. We know major policy change, which is what is required, it's not a bit of tinkering on the margins. Major policy change is difficult and quite rare because policymakers are locked in by policy regimes. So there's a, there's a whole literature on policy regimes, which of course fits very nicely with my idea of, of regimes. So these are some of the references, I've got them all at the end, Weaver and Pearson and Howlett. They all talk about policy regimes, which consist of the networks, so the, who are sitting, not just the policy makers, but also who is invited you know, to, to provide their input to, to the policy making process, often uh, business interests, institutional procedures and shared ideas, so the policy paradigm about how you think about uh, what is the problem, how you define the problem, and how do you think about solutions. So we know there are policy regimes, which means you know, most, policy make, most policy making is usually incremental. You know, learning by doing, a little bit of thinking, a little, little bit of adjusting. So major policy change, which is what we now need, is difficult and rare. So the focus on you know, political courage or political will, as we see from uh, Figueres and others, you know, it's, it's nice, but it's a bit futile and a bit, you know, it's very voluntarist and individualist. Because it's not just about single individuals that will have to lead. Uh, of course, they, they can play a role, usually it's in a, in a, in a wider context. So it, it's, it's better to look at what are the conditions under which policymakers are, are willing to be decisive. So where does political will come from, rather than assuming it's something, oh, I just decide I'm going to do this. It's more, what are the conditions under which policymakers might be willing you know, to, to defect from the existing regime and, and switch their support to uh, the niche innovation. So it's really about coalitions and it's about defection. So in, in the MLP picture, that would look like this. So I'm, usually we study you know, the bottom up and the niches and that, that remains important, the empowerment and the building of coalitions and all that. But my proposition in this talk is that for the acceleration, particularly by the state, and I'm not saying it's the only acceleration mechanism, 
But a really important one is this defection of incumbent policymakers who get fed up with the existing regime, and I'll, I'll give some examples of what that might mean, who get fed up with the existing regime, are willing to, th to throw their support, to switch allegiance, throw their support behind niche innovations. So that does not mean that policymakers shape transitions from the start. It, they can do occasionally, but this is more, they can be an important accelerator at the tipping points. And that they can really, in sort of the, the S-curve, the tipping point, they can, they can make that go faster. So this picture also shows then that policymakers will face pressures from the various niche dimensions, so the industry, science, policy, culture, they, they will all have sort of effects, but also the niche actors will be lobbying uh, policymakers. So as James said, policymakers are, are like the, the conductor of an orchestra. They, they're important anyhow, they, the property rights, the market conditions, the regulations. So all the actors always try to shape policymakers. So this means also, you know, this whole conference is about politics, which is a hugely <laughs> diffuse kind of term, and you can talk about I mean, you know, many, many, many political science theories, but also you can talk about politics at many kind of levels. And the way I'm talking about it here is, is decisively at the MISO level, which is talking about whole policy domains. I'm not looking at single instruments, I'm not looking at single policy makers, or, or you know, a Trump, or particular individuals doing things, of course, that always happens, and that's what most of the media is about, and it's all very entertaining to read. But that's not what I will be talking about here. Of course, you can also talk about macro politics, you know, with institutions, struggles between classes, you know, labor and capital, and, and that's, a, that's another, you know, varieties of capitalism. That, that kind of is another kind of literature, which is really at a macro level. So I think when we talk about politics, it's really, and then of course you also have policy, polity, and politics. So it's. It's a diffuse term, and I'm, this is a table I got from uh, Jan-Peter Voss, which I thought was quite illuminating, to at least help you understand a little bit better what are the dimensions of politics and what are sort of the, the levels. And of course, you can, you can study at all of them, and I know there are many political science theories. I'll only use one of them, historical institutionalism, so you can correct me later and talk about why didn't you do advocacy coalitions or, or punctuate equilibrium or multiple streams. So I'm just saying there are lots of, lots of approaches and I'm going to use this, this historical institutionalism. So why historical institutionalism in political science that's really looking at the MISO level of whole policy domains, not individual instruments? They have done lots of studies in the past um, about which are longitudinal. So political revolutions, the work by Theodore Scotchpole, welfare state, where does the welfare states come from, uh, the rise of democracy, major reforms. So there's lots of examples in that literature that studies decades-long processes and major changes. They're also interesting, I think, that approach, and quite compatible with the MLP, because it's, it's really got a processual orientation. You know, longitudinal processes, struggles between collective actors, so uh, Pearson, in particular, talks about interest groups, mass publics, and state actors. So when I talk about politics, it's not only the sort of, you know, what's happening in the political, in parliaments. It's also about mass publics, what's going on in the media, and business interests, and, and the lobbying, and the policy networks behind them. Historical institutionalism also then looks really at struggle, you know, conflicts, but also about institutions, because it says, you know, the, the groups... Some groups are privileged, you know, they have more access to the policy makers, they invited to sit around the table, more access than others. So it, the, the institutions favor some groups over others, and they're not neutral. Um, a drawback of this approach, and I would say more generally political science, is they pay very little attention to technology, you know, which is maybe because most of the studies are about the welfare state and how you distribute money, the health system or other, other welfare uh, issues. So I think that's a weakness, and that's maybe where we can contribute something to the political science literature more generally. So that literature, historical institutionalism, has two ways of thinking about major policy change. So Pearson talks about path dependence. That's really coming from the economic approach of path dependence, the increasing returns to adoption. So it says there are policy feedbacks which create lock-in. So policymakers are locked in to a particular policy regime, and they cannot change. So it really places all the explanatory emphasis on external shocks, which then unlock the regime and create a, a critical juncture, and only in that critical juncture is there some space for agency which can lead to major change. So it's quite a deterministic kind of approach, and it doesn't leave a lot of space for, for agency. 
Luckily, in, in recent years, it's also a more uh, power distributional approach, particularly by Mahoney and Talon, but uh, a range of others as well, which is more sociological and says any regime, any institution needs continuous reproduction. You know, it's not just locked in and, and they are stable forever. It needs to be continuously reproduced, defended, repaired and upgraded. So that means there are continuous struggles as well. Uh, and major change involves struggles between the incumbent, the, the dominant coalition needs to get weaker. And then there's a subordinate coalition, the challengers, which needs to get stronger. So you can use social movement theory if you want to, mobilization, framing, agenda setting. And of course, this, these ideas fit also quite nicely with, uh, with the MLP. So the first one really emphasizes the landscape shocks. You need an external shock to unlock the regime and then something can happen. Whereas the other approach is much more about uh, struggles between niche coalitions and regime actors. Uh, well, that's basically what I've said, what I've said on this slide. Um, so if you then look at what are the... Um, so the policymakers, they face pressures, as I said, because they're the conductor of the game, from... Uh, I'm, I'm, re I'm reformulating and extending a little bit the Pearson typology here. So we're going to look at business actors and lobby groups. This is the interest groups, as he calls them. And media and cultural discourse, which is what he calls uh, mass publics. But also with users, people that actually use particular technologies in their daily life. It's again mass publics. And we're adding the category of technology, which is, is missing in historical institutionalism. And then we, we try to understand major policy change as a shifting balance of power between these two coalitions. So the, the regime, coalition, regime coalition needs to get weaker. So policymakers need to get really fed up with the existing regime. There was problems, accumulating frustration, need for subsidies or protection. And then there also needs to be a niche coalition, which is quite promising that, 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 that policymakers are willing to defect towards. So you can almost see like push and pull uh, factors here. So then briefly, just to summarize, and the paper has got a lot more text on this, what are the conditions for policy defection? So on the business side, you need to get economic problems in the incumbent regime. So the, they're not doing well, they need uh, subsidies to be propped up, and, and over time that leads increasingly to frustrations by policymakers. You know, why can't these incumbent firms get their act together? But at the same time, you also need uh, interesting new businesses that are also lobbying for more support and they may be attractive opportunities for policymakers. On the cultural side, you need critical discourses that erode the legitimacy of the existing regime, whereas also you need positive discourses about the new innovations, you know, we're entering a new age, uh, it's all going to be wonderful, we're going to solve these problems. And then on the user side, you need to get uh, people getting fed up with the, with the functionality of the existing regime and quite excited about the new technology. And on the technology dimension, <clears throat> You either have critical failures or infrastructure problems, and the new technologies need to provide uh, attractive opportunities. So these, these are some of the conditions under which a policy, if this, all these things happen, policymakers are quite willing to say, well, we're going to abandon the existing regime, we're going to shift our support to this, to this promising uh, niche innovation. So just to make it a little bit more concrete, I've got two brief examples. One is the uh, shift from the railway regime to uh, road transport in the United Kingdom. Trains, of course, in the 19th century were the dominant transport regime for a long time until after the Second World War. Uh, then you see the explosion of, of mobility. This is in passenger kilometers uh, and, and the cars overtaking uh, trains. So that's the transition I'm talking about, the shift from railways uh, to cars. The policy regime shift that took place was that before the war, policy wasn't okay. There was a bit of transport policy, but not much. It was mostly dealing with externalities, so dealing with speed problems, safety, rural bright, and, and a little bit of piecemeal road expansion. So it, it was it was not you know that fitted in the era. It was not very uh, hands-on. After the war, you get a very interventionist. This was a completely different policy regime. Very interventionist actively embracing the motor age, you know, the, uh, following the United States example, and spending lots of money on building a uh, motorway network. So that's represented in this graph below. The spending before the war was quite low. And then after the war, you see uh, a massive acceleration of, uh, of spending on particularly the building of the highway network, not just in the, in the, in the UK, but also in the US and, and, and other countries. So that's, and, and that's the shift that took place in terms of policy networks. You also see 
uh, interest groups, particularly the British Road Federation, are really becoming a very close insider to the transport ministry. They're almost being invited to all the meetings, sitting around the table, and of course providing their inputs. So how did this come about? How did, how did, these, how did these factors, why, why did this happen in the 1950s, which was, which, which was the tipping point? So I'll just brief, briefly run you through these, uh, these examples. On the technology side, there was a lot of damage to the railway network, so that needed a lot of repair to upgrade. The businesses, railways really were very weak and had been weak since the 1930s and needed continuous handouts, uh, financial support, policy makers got increasingly frustrated. Why, why do we keep subsidizing these railways? Why can't they get their act together? The cultural discourse was again very negative, but already before the war, railways were seen as monopolists who didn't care about consumers and they were just uh, uh, low service quality and, and uh, they, were, they were not happy with them. And the same were, were, were customers, very frustrated with all the delays and the repairs, a little bit like, like the UK uh, now. <laughs> On the positive side, there were these, the cars, you know, after the Second World War were getting better, uh, more competitive, they, 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 uh, they, but the infrastructure was not there yet, so that was a moderate sort of pull factor. Very strong push from the, from the industry, you know, the, the UK at that time really still built cars and they were quite promising. Not only cars, but also buses and, and, and trucks, so there was a real road lobby, uh, very strong. The discourse was massively posi positive, there was real talk about, you know, we're entering a new era, a new age, like we're now doing with, with the internet. The motor age is coming, the United States is leading already, we need to follow them, of course they were looking at Germany as well. So we, we, need, we need to uh, upgrade and we need to start investing in our infrastructure. And then consumers also were really fed up with the railways and were really sort of latent demand. They were quite excited about buying cars and they, and they did so increasingly as, as they got uh, richer. So this is quite a good example where you, on most dimensions you see the regime was really in trouble technologically, economically, in terms of discourse, consumers getting fed up and, and the niche was very promising. So, and, and of course those trends, one was getting stronger, the other was getting weaker. So at some point in the 1950s, I mean they wanted to go earlier but they had no money immediately after the war, so it wasn't until the, the, the 1950s that policymakers really were defecting and, and, and really accelerating this transition. So they were not, this is an example, this where they were not steering it from the beginning, you know, I'm not saying that at all, but they did accelerate it after the Second World War. So they did not, not lead, but they, did, they were a crucial accelerator. So the second case, also quite brief, is the shift from uh, mixed agriculture to a high input specialized uh, wheat agriculture. So this is the improvement that you see in terms of the wheat yields, almost 100% improvement about how much wheat you could get from, uh, from uh, one hectare, which was due to underlying changes, the shift from horses to tractors, the much more uh, money that far farmers would spend in terms of uh, expenditure and total costs, which went from 10% of their total cost to, to 30% of the inputs, both fertil fertilizer and, and machinery. And this was not, an, uh, well, no, let me. So the, the policy regime shift that we see here is before the war, Britain had really, you know, they, had an, they still had an empire, it was free trade, so they didn't actually, agriculture, domestic was not so important, they imported most of their food from the, from the colonies. It was laissez-faire with some income support. There was an agricultural depression in the 30s, and they gave a little bit of money to not let com the farmers completely uh, uh, wither away. After the war, it became highly interventionist. And there were three big goals. Uh, improved food security, and that they wanted to enhance domestic production, cheap food consumption for consumers, uh, and provide reasonable incomes for farmers. And again, in terms of the policy networks, the, pol the, the, the National Farmers Union, Again, a really strong lobby group became part of the policy networks, and this is always seen as the archetypical iron triangle. So this transition was really accelerated by policymakers firing on all cylinders. You know, you fix the prices, put the prices really high, guarantee the markets, technical advice, investment grants for farmers, demonstration farms. So they, on all cylinders, they were helping this transition. You know, massive amounts of money were, were spent also in terms of making the land quite nice and flat and dry, irrigation, so the tractors could use them. And, but this was not, you know, this, there were lots of losers as well, because this meant farmers had to get bigger. So this was not a consensual, you know, uh, there was a huge shakeout in consolidation. I think 80% of farmers went out of business and only, only the biggest ones uh, survived. <coughs> 
So again, just briefly talking you through about what happens here. This is a slightly different case, which is more, of course, the, the, the external shock. The external shock, of course, was the Second World War, where the German submarines really were threatening the import of food. So there was a real threat that the UK would starve in the war. So this, the, the, the niche was quite weak. Okay, there were tractors and there were some fertilizers, uh, but actually the, we had just been through a... Uh, oh, I don't know why I'm saying we. I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm, I'm Dutch, and maybe I'm beginning to internalize it. So the, the British, sorry. <laughs> the British farmers uh, had very little money because there had been an agricultural depression, so they couldn't invest. The farms were still too small, so tractors actually didn't make much sense. Uh, there was some concern about farmers, uh, some concern about prairie farming, now looking at the United States. Uh, but the, the niche was there and had been existing for a while, but it was not a very strong kind of pool. But the push was massive, of course. This threat of, of starvation and disruption really gave policymakers that they, well, we cannot let this happen. You know, our, our, our technology is really vulnerable. We cannot just rely on food import. We really need to produce it ourselves. Uh, we need to help our farmers. We need to make them strong. We need to, uh, there was a concern about the countryside as well. So this, this was a real uh, example of this, this path-dependent approach. You know, external shock, regime falls apart, policymakers need to do something massive. So this was an example where the policymakers were almost initiating it and, and really driving it from the start. And I gave you quite a few examples of how they did it. You know, they they de-risked everything, they gave lots of money, they fixed the prices and a very positive uh, discourse. So the conclusions. These two cases, but also the other ones that we, that we studied, uh, show that policymakers can certainly accelerate transitions. Does not mean they always drive it from the start, but very often they can be sort of the tipping point that makes it accelerate. It's quite rare, however, it only happens in certain conditions. So the first four I've mentioned here, we already sort of know from the literature, niche innovation and, and others. There need to be feasible solutions there, uh, there which is also uh, a point from Kingdom, you know, you need to be able to reorient to something. A lobby from new firms that are saying, you know, if you support us, there's more growth and jobs and something positive. Demand from consumers will certainly help and a positive cultural discourse. So we know these, these factors are important and of course our literature is, is emphasising these points as well, this, the, the literature on, on empowerment for instance. But I think one point that has not been picked up so much and I think that's really an, an added value of our uh, paper, Okay, you need all those niche conditions, but that happens all the time. All the niche actors always say, give us money and we've got a fantastic solution and the discourse is great. But then you're not going to get this defection until you also have this weakening of the regimes. When there's a really negative discourse about the existing regime, economic problems for incumbent firms which cannot survive on their own, need continuous handouts, and whether or not there are shocks. So I think it's the com those are the combinations that you need under these conditions, policymakers are willing to, to really introduce decisive change. So these are some findings from the past, so then on my last slide, of course, what does that mean for the future? If we look at sustainability transitions, can we see if these conditions are there, are they arising or not? I think on the positive side, we do see in some sectors and in some countries, I think we do see these conditions for acceleration uh, emerging. I think particularly in electricity and a little bit also in, in the car uh, sector. So in the electricity sector you see real price performance improvements in solar PV and wind and battery electric vehicles. So the solutions are there. The new industries, solar and wind, are quite uh, are growing very fast. You know, when people make all kind of estimates about how much the employment is. You know, it's so a 200,000, 300,000. So that's, that, that fits also nicely. There are very positive discourses uh, about renewable energy in particular, also about electric vehicles increasingly. But it's also a little bit countered by concerns, of course, about subsidies and grid stability, so the discourse is not entirely uh, unmixed. And you also see erosion and weakening, particularly, I think, of the coal regime, where, you know, you see, I think there's like 20 countries in the world that have now decided to phase out uh, coal. Uh, nuclear is also doing uh, quite, uh, well, bad in many countries, ex except the UK. I think it's one of the few democratic countries that is actually going for, for nuclear. All the other countries are more authoritarian. Um, so the discourse, the competitive and the subsidies are really weakening these, these coal and nuclear regimes. And I think in the car industry you see also the incumbents are internalizing the idea that change is coming. You know, uh, the electric vehicles for sure, 
and, and many car companies have committed to them, many cities are phasing out, uh, countries, countries are phasing out diesel and, 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 and other car. Uh, and of course you've got sharing and the autonomous vehicles. So there's a real, compared to five years ago, I think the, the car industry is now really accepting that change is, is coming. So in, in those industries, we do see these conditions for major policy change are arising. And indeed, I think that's also leading to quite strong subsidies, uh, protection, phase-out policies, stronger com the, the commitment is getting stronger. However, I think in many other sectors, agro-food, housing, heating, I'm afraid we don't yet see these conditions very strongly arising. The niche innovations are still very expensive. The regimes are not very stabilized. Now the agro food is still dominating, the supermarkets are very strong. So, so that's a little bit the more pessimistic uh, story. That I, I, of course, policymakers are subsidizing and, and, and helping some of the niches, but I don't yet see in many of these other sectors a decisive uh, shift uh, happening at this, at this stage, which is maybe you know, a bit worrying if you talk about climate change. And we know we need to accelerate, but I'm afraid at this point it does not happen uh, very widely. That does not mean that policymakers only need to passively wait for those conditions to arise. That's, that's my last point. This literature on historical institutionalism also talks about policy feedbacks and how policymakers can, you know, by stimulating incremental gradual processes, such as learning and, and price performance improvement and coalition building and creating markets, you can hopefully create some of the conditions by, by setting the coalitions in train and, and, and making them stronger. So, uh, my, my end conclusion about where we are compared to the past is that we're not yet at this point of decisive acceleration, even though we know we should. I don't think it's yet happening in, in, in most sectors, but it does not mean that policymakers need to wait passively. They, they, you know, it, it is moving in the direction, but still going, still going uh, too slow, I'm afraid. So thanks very much. <laughs>